Hello, uh, so I'm Alice. I'm from the Fresh Perspectives team at Fabrica Gallery. And this is interview is part of a um, uh, online screening of The Fall and Dislocation Blues by Sky Obinka, who's joining us today. Hello, Sky. Hi. Hi. Um, so I guess it'd be great to start off by talking about uh, what got you into film. And uh, you, you've spoken before about how your sort of primary audience is your family and following that your tribe. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit about your upbringing and what influence that's had on you. Yeah, I mean, I got into film because uh, it, was, it was a way that really combined a lot of my interests and passions, like one of them being music. Like, I don't know, I started playing guitar when I was like 13 or 14 and was in bands and all that. And um, from there, like I started getting into like music editing and like recording instrumentations and like arranging things and like on my own in my bedroom. And I just really liked the process of that. And also like during college, I studied English literature and writing and I wanted to be a writer. And there was this, um, I don't know, it didn't quite work out. And after, after, you know, kind of floating around for a bit, I stumbled on film in a way where um, like me filming my friends and I building a traditional indigenous fishing scaffold on the Columbia River was just kind of happenstance, but then also it was a way to think about um, these sorts of stories or think about like documentary um, and I don't know, like making narratives without having to explain what all of the subtext is and like what how, how to contextualize it in a contemporary sort of like um, white settler sort of society. And like what happens when you make films that are primarily for an indigenous audience and you know what sort of things do you not have to explain and what sort of things can you just like kind of get to and so that was that was really where my, my, my interest in film started as well as just thinking about the contemporary landscape of indigenous cinema and even thinking about like my background and thinking about how I grew up and like the kind of films that I'd seen and the kind of, I don't know, stories that really affect me and how I view myself. And a lot of them are based in trauma. A lot of them are based in um, a historical romanticization of how Native Americans used to exist in this country. And I mean, that really affects you, what it affects you as a child, um, thinking about yourself in that way as either an anachronism or not as good as you know, our ancestors. And I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think that the, the, the medium of, of film or cinema has really provided me a way to explore what it means to be a contemporary indigenous person today and what that has the possibility to look like without all of the baggage that is often heaped on our backs as we move through like the art world or the film world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and picking up on what you said about sort of what does native cinema look like to a native audience? How how do you find it when you when you show your films to people in your communities? Is that is that a very nerve wracking experience? And I was wondering, particularly with Dislocation Blues, if you could speak about a bit about when you showed showed people. Yeah, I mean, like the the, the range is always like varied and wide. I mean, like in terms of like what people get from like these films. I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, it's also like hard too, because like generally you know, someone comes up to you and like tells you what they think about their film, it's usually like positive, but it's very rarely someone like says, I hate that, you know, what are you doing? Um, yeah. So it's kind of hard to like be subjective in that sort of sense. But I mean, I just, I also do think of these films as like, I don't know, beginnings of conversations or, or ways to ask questions rather than provide answers. And with a film like This Location Blues, that was one of those ways too, where it's like, I don't know, I think like, the people that I've shown it to that, or I've seen it, that, ha that were at Standing Rock and part of that movement, I mean, they respond to it in generally positive ways, or like they get like what I'm up to. And um, I think that it's, it's also just something too, like where, yeah, three years ago, a lot of people knew what was going on in Standing Rock and what was going on with this movement. And there was a lot of media coverage. And in a lot of ways, like I felt like, yeah, I don't have to tell the entire Standing Rock story. You know, I don't need to tell everything that is going on from beginning to end because it's impossible or try to be um, a replicative of an experience of having been there. And I don't know, so for me, just like focusing on processing the, the, the aftermath of just even being there was what the film turned into by way of the conversation with Cleo, which, which happened two or three months after the camps were closed down. Right. Um, so yeah, I just, it's, it's like focusing on something that is really hard to put your finger on with a movement such as that. Um, 
I know like, like that's that's like that's those are the cracks that I'm interested in like like going through and exploring and I think that people respond generally well to them or in, in ways that is about generating a conversation and I think the, the metric that I would use in terms of like the success or failure of the film is just the conversations that I have had with people about their experiences there and those have always been been, been really I don't know generative and important to me yeah and and um picking up on on Cleo and because Cleo narrated a lot of the um, film and I was just wondering how how you met him and if you could speak a bit more about your relationship with him yeah I met him two years before maybe a year year and a half but um, I was making a book trailer for this poet Adrian C Lewis indigenous poet and um, a friend that I had started working with um, like knew Cleo and was like yeah like they're they're, they're game they're interested in acting and um, yeah I I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting because like I never like did narrative stuff before, or I have like very loosely, and so it's always like challenging working with with actors or people that um, I don't know are expecting some sort of direction. And like through that process, I met Cleo, and like I don't know, we kept in touch, you know, over social media. And when I was going back and forth to the camps, like our paths crossed, and we never quite lined up in terms of when we were both there. But I don't know. Like I always knew that I don't know. Like, I just wanted to talk to Cleo. Like Cleo's like. I don't know, I think brilliant and like expresses themselves in very interesting ways that I don't know are often difficult for me to express myself. And so when I knew I wanted to do an interview, I knew that I, was, I, I wanted to do it with Cleo. And um, yeah, so just that conversation was, I don't know, like a continuing one from when I first met them two or three years before, two years, I can't remember. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I'd always been impressed by Cleo and just wanted to hear more what they had to say right and um i was also going to ask about sort of because obviously they've just announced that the access pipeline is being shut down um and uh sort of if you're making any more work about it or um what's the sort of general feeling at the moment with people that you know who are there um general sort of feeling is i don't know reluctant and skeptical optimism you know yeah so it's hard to say what'll happen, especially with the administration over here and just the state of the world right now. And it's scary and it feels like really hard to be hopeful for anything. And uh, in terms of like any work that I'm making, I don't know, like, I mean, I just feel exhausted and I've, I've kind of taken a little bit of a break because I finished my first feature film this past January and I don't know. Yeah, it, it feels like now I need to kind of just stop and process a bit and just think about what's I don't know how I exist in this world right now and what that looks like moving forward with these films or these photographs or these writings that I do. And um, it's, like, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to say like what is coming next, but I do know that um, like the conversation around the, the, the pipeline being shut down or put on hold and the, um, the, the Washington football team changing their names and how indigenous people are part of this conversation and also not part of the conversation right now in terms of these movements. And just like kind of trying to reconcile that and just like pause and think about what it means to be indigenous right now in the yeah. United States specifically. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sky. Well, I think that's all we have time for, but thank you very much for, for joining us today. It's been yeah, brilliant no to you. <laughs> Great, thank you.